So welcome to this YSL tutorial on scraping websites using Python. Here's what you'll learn during the tutorial. So we'll begin by looking at some problems you may encounter. It might seem a gloomy way to start, but you have to be realistic about you will and what you will and won't be able to achieve. And we'll also look at different scraping tools in this section. We'll then go on to look at our example HTML for the case study we're going to do during the tutorial. And then we're going to look at the document object model, how an HTML page is constructed into different sections. We'll look at the HTML tags and attributes. So tags are things like IMG for image, P for paragraph, div for div section. And then we're going to look at element IDs and class names and how cascading style sheets use them to impose formatting. We'll then go on to look at getting HTML from a website using the request module within Python. And then we'll go on to look at getting HTML from a file for which you don't need the request module. And that will allow us to do our case study. And finally, we'll then look at actually scraping a website using the Beautiful Soup module with its wonderful name. We'll then look at elements of Beautiful Soup. So we'll look at chaining elements together. We'll look at how you can get navigable strings, which is basically readable text from a website. We'll look at how you can navigate the document object model by its relatives, so things like parents and children and siblings and so on. And then we'll look at how you can find elements by their either their tag name or their ID or their class or whatever it may be. And finally, we'll look at doing the same things using jQuery style or CSS style selectors. So there's lots to cover. At the top right of your screen about now, a link should appear. And you can click on that to see the many files and exercises to do with this tutorial. If it doesn't appear, you can click on the same link on the YouTube page for this tutorial. But that's enough of me. I'm going to vanish now and Sven will take you through the rest of the tutorial. So let's get started. So before we look at how you can scrape a website in Python, let's look at some problems that you're going to have to encounter. It may seem a bit gloomy starting like this, but you have to be realistic in life. So I can think of seven, believe it or not. Um, firstly, you might have legal and ethical reasons why you shouldn't scrape a website. You need to be able to understand the HTML, which won't always be easy. You need to be able to cope with pages or websites which are written very much with JavaScript in mind, so you can't necessarily actually see the underlying HTML. You need to get around password protection so that you can scrape a web page. And likewise, you need to get around uh, captures which are designed to filter out robots, like you possibly. You need to be able to make sure that you're looking at the correct version of a web page. So if you and I both go to a web page, who's to say we're even looking at the same thing? And finally, you need to decide which web scraper you're going to use. So let's look at each of those in turn. Beginning with legal and ethical issues, so I've taken here more or less at random, the Monopoly game and the McDonald's website at the time of speaking. And you could, if you like, scrape their website. And if you could get to the underlying code, you could publish it on your own. Apart from the fact I don't think you'll be able to get to the underlying code, there's legal and ethical problems with this. Legal, because I think McDonald's would send you a cease and desist letter within a couple of hours. And ethical, because you're stealing someone else's property. We get lots of people uh, browsing our website and taking our videos, and it always hurts. Uh, we try to follow it up where possible. Please don't do it. It's, it's just not a nice thing to do. So make sure you're only taking publicly available information. So the second issue is, are you going to understand the HTML? This is the Premier League website. I took it more or less again at random. And what you see on screen definitely doesn't easily translate into the HTML. So that's going to be a big thing to get over. The third thing you're going to have to get around is client script. This is a big problem. There's a BBC homepage today, and there's what it looks like in HTML. There's absolutely no way I could scrape it because everything is hidden away with calls to JavaScript functions and things like that. So it will be almost impossible to browse this website unless I use a specialist tool like Selenium more on that in a second. So the fourth problem you may have is password protected sites. I've chosen the American Express site, but I could have chosen anything really. You're not going to be able to get at the underlying HTML unless you get through the security barrier. It can be done, but it's another problem. A fifth problem you may have is captures, des captures designed to um, filter out robots like yourself possibly. 
So there's a couple of images there. I'm sure everybody watching this video has seen before on different websites. Um, so that's another problem, obstacle in your way. A sixth problem is which version are you seeing? When I go to a web page, am I looking at the same as you? Here's four reasons why that might not be the case. We might be using different platforms. What you see on your mobile may be very different to what I see on my laptop. I might have turned JavaScript off. I'll see something very different then. We might be using, or the website might be using something called A-B testing. People like Amazon do this all the time. They serve up different versions of a website and gauge from the reaction of their browsers which one to keep. So it's quite possible you could log on to a web page twice in a row and see different things. And fourthly, the cookies I've got on my web page, on my computer rather, will determine what I see. Um, so again, we may not necessarily be seeing the same thing as each other. So given all that, which web scraper should you choose? Well, there are three main choices uh, which seem to come up. Beautiful Soup, which is the one I'm going to cover in this tutorial. Scrapey, which seems another good choice. And Selenium, which is, I think, more difficult to learn, but also more powerful. From everything, I, all the research I've done, I think Beautiful Soup seems a very good choice. It's nice and easy. It's very well documented and very powerful. But if you're going to get around some of the problems I've described in this, like uh, robots, captures, password protection, and so on, it may be that you want to get your web scraper to behave more like a human being. And for that, Selenium is probably the best choice. But what I would probably recommend doing is starting with Beautiful Soup, mastering the basics of scraping a website, and then maybe moving on to something more um, powerful. So in order to be able to make sure that everyone watching this tutorial experiences exactly the same thing, rather than relying on a public website, I've created a file called windham.htm. It's one of the files attached to this tutorial. And if you go to that, you might be able to see that it lists out films, sorry, books rather, by one of my favourite authors, John Wyndham. It references a file called wiseourlogo.png, which is an image. So it'd be nice to be able to right click on this and browse it, but unfortunately you can't do that in the default version of Visual Studio Code. So what I'm going to do is just go to this icon in the activity bar at the bottom, and we're going to install a browser. So if I type in it's not a browser, the ability to go to a browser. If I type in the word browser in the search bar, you can see the open in browser extension is the first one which comes up with 4.5 million hits. That's got to be reliable, surely. So if I install that, it takes only a second or two on my machine at the moment, possibly because it's not the first time I've done it. And then if I go back to my list of files, and if I go to my Wyndham file, I can right click anywhere I like on that and choose to open it in my either my default browser or any other one. And what that will do is show what it looks like. You can see I've already had a go at doing this before. And what it does is list out six of six books by John Wyndham. And that's what we're going to use for our scraping examples. So if you want to be able to scrape a website or a web page, you're going to need to understand the document object model in HTML. So let's have a look at that. If you right click on a page like the one I've just told you about, the Wyndham.html file, and if you choose to open it in a browser, this is what uh, HTML renders as in your browser. What that means is the browser takes the underlying hypertext markup language, that's what HTML stands for, and interprets it and presents it on screen like this. If you want to see the underlying source code for any web page, you can right click and choose to view the page source, and you can usually press Control U to do the same thing. And what that will do is open up another file listing out the HTML. You can do this for any web page. Any web page that you look at will begin with normally with an HTML instruction. And then following that is the header section. So the header section is a bit at the top, which tells you about how the page is going to work. But it doesn't actually contain anything you'll ever be able to see on screen. So when you're scraping a web page, you can usually ignore this. Following that is the body section. And the body section is the heart and soul of the web page. And it goes on from, for the, pretty much the rest of the page. So that's the bit we'll actually be scraping. And right at the end is the, an instruction which says that's the end of all the HTML. So that's one way of looking at it. But if we close that down and go back to our web page, you can also, in most browsers, press the F12 key. So I'm going to do that now. 
And what that will do is open up something called Developer Tools. And if you click on the Elements tag here, then you can normally see how the document model, object model is structured. That's it in Edge. I just want to show you that it does work in uh, Chrome 2, for example. If I do the same thing in Chrome and press the F12 key, I've got pretty much the same um, schematic here. So let's close that down and go back to Edge. So what you can do in this is see the main sections, the header section, the body section, and then all the div sections. You can see if I look at any div section, which corresponds to a block in your HTML file, that might have another div section within it, or a paragraph, for example. And if I go down to this div section, you can see this contains a table, and the table contains a table body, and the body contains table rows, and each table row contains either table headers or table data, and they may contain links as well. So there's this hierarchical structure of how the tags are linked together, and it's tags and attributes I want to look at in the next part of this tutorial. So as well as understanding the document object model, you need an appreciation of tags and attributes to be able to scrape a web page. So let's look at those in turn. Our example contains at the top a picture of a Wise Owl logo and John Wyndham's name, and that's generated by this HTML. So let's look at that in more detail. If you look at the beginning, there's a div tag, and a div tag means there's a block of text. I guess it sounds for division, maybe. Whenever you have a tag which begins something, it has to have an endpoint. And the endpoint is exactly the same, with the exception you have a forward slash in front of the tag name. So to give another example, there's an A tag signifying the beginning of a hyperlink. That's where the image is clickable. And there's the end A tag there. So that's what tags are, but you'll notice each tag also has attributes. So let's have a look at those. So taking this time, the example of the image tag. Now the image tag violates the rules I've just explained to you because it doesn't have a closing part. And some tags are like that, unfortunately. They're called self-closing, I think. This image tag has four attributes, style, SRC, alt, and width. And they're listed at the bottom there. So the style is saying how it appears, the source is saying where the picture is coming from, the alt is saying what will appear in a tooltip when you let your mouse linger over it, and the width is saying how wide the image will appear. And if you look at all the other tags in that HTML, they've all got different attributes. So having looked at that, let's now have a look at classes and IDs in HTML to complete the picture. So the final piece of our HTML jigsaw is looking at tags, classes, and elements, or IDs, to see how things are styled with something called CSS, or Cascading Style Sheets. So what I've done is I've taken a copy of this file to Wyndham Temp, because I'm going to make changes to it, which I don't really want to keep, and I'm going to browse this. What I want to do is explain why three bits of formatting appear. The first one is why the words John Wyndham appear in a larger font, the second one is why this box appears with a thin line around it. And the third one is why each of these links appears in blue. And it turns out the reason for each of those is different. So going, going back to the HTML, let's start with a, a font of the title. So the title is here. Let's just highlight it, saying H1 John Wyndham. So H1 is a tag, which means it's the most important heading. You can have H1 up to H9, I think. So why is that appearing in a different font? There's no formatting applied to that tag, but if you go up to the top of the page, you can see there's a section on styles. Now this is called cascading styles, and is normally contained in a separate file called a cascading style sheet. That's what the CSS there stands for. And it contains a set of instructions which we're going to have a look at. So the first set of instruction it contains is that the H, anything where the H1 tag appears will be formatted with 20 pixel font size. And that's why the font's appearing bigger. So just in case you don't believe me, let's make a bit of a change to it. Let's add a text decoration property to underline. So that should automatically underline text. And what I've done is just save that. So that's why the icon there has disappeared. And if I go back to my browser and refresh my browser by pressing F5, you can see the words John Wyndham are now underlined. So 
The idea behind CSS is to separate the presentation of the data on your page from how, it, how it's formatted. And it's near universal good practice to do it like this. Now, you may be picky, notice that I haven't always followed these rules. For example, I've got an image there where I've actually put some styling within it, and I've got a div tag where I've styled that too. But by and large, that's bad practice, and on a web page, you should separate out your content and your formatting. So let's look at the second example of how this is done. What we're going to do is have a look at the box around uh, this the list of uh, books. So this is coming from this instruction. Let's just highlight it again. That is the box. So why has it got a board around it? There's nothing within that div tag saying that should be the case. Well, again, the answer is in our styles at the top. If I go back up to the top, you can see that there is this instruction with a hash in front of it. What that hash means is if the browser finds an element which has an ID attribute of table dash box, then it should format it with a border, solid border, and make it 600 pixels wide. And again, I think you probably do believe me by now, but I'm still going to illustrate it. Let's change that to five pixels. This is not going to look very nice. If I then go back to the web page and refresh it, you can see I get a much thicker border. So that is coming, if we go back down, just to remind you, from the ID attribute there. Now it's possible I could apply the ID attribute to more than one tag. Firstly, that would be terrible HTML practice because the whole idea behind an ID is it should be unique on the page. And secondly, browsers may treat it differently. Most browsers will pick out the first element with the ID tag and ignore the rest, but you can't be sure. So the whole idea of an ID tag is it should be unique on the page. So that's classes and IDs or elements. Uh, sorry, tags or IDs or elements. The last bit of the picture is classes. You'll notice that every single link appears in blue. And the reason for that is every single link has got this attribute assigned to it, class equals link. So you use class when you don't just want a single uh, tag to appear in a certain way, you want anything belonging to that group. And as you probably expect by now, if we go up to the top and have a look at our styles, we'll find the corresponding style for that. In fact, there it is. So what this is saying is any tag which has got a link class set for it will automatically appear in blue. So um, I could, if I liked, change this. Let's change this to red. And when I refresh the page and go back to my browser and press F5 to refresh it, you can see all the color of my links changes. So classes are a great way to um, set general changes for all the elements of a particular type. And those are your three building blocks, tags, elements, and classes. And the entire World Wide Web, I would say, slightly exaggerating, is built upon this principle of having a separate style sheet normally, which you don't normally get to see, containing instructions for how to format your elements on your page. And then the elements themselves, which either invoke an ID, or which invoke a class, or which are formatted just by virtue of being of a particular tag. So that's how HTML works. So you can either get HTML from a website address or from a file. So in this part of the tu tutorial, we'll look at getting it from a website address or a URL or uniform resource locator, as they're actually called. And the one we're going to use is called pythonscraping.com, which I think is available to anybody to use. I think that's the idea behind it. So to do this, if we go into Visual Studio Code, open up the terminal window, and then in this, let's firstly find out if we have the request module installed, which is a module you can use um, to go to a website and get the underlying HTML. So I'm going to type pip space list to list my modules, and you can see request isn't there. So the first thing I need to do is install it. So I'll type pip space install uh, space requests. And when I press return, it should install that module. So that's good news. I can now go to a file. I've created one called the request module.py. And in this, I should be able now to import my request module. So that's good because it means I can go to a website. So let's do exactly that. Let's go to a website.
And to do that, uh, you can create a variable to hold the response. It's normally called either R or response. I'm going to go for the longer, more descriptive response. I can put in the name of my module and use the get method. And then in quotation marks, I can put in the website address I want to go to. I think I've got it listed there. That should do it. Now, the next thing I need to do is test the status returned. So to do that, I can say if the response and there's a status code property. And if you let your mouse linger over it, you'll see it's an integer. So what I can do is firstly, I'll test for what's called a 404 error. And that means that the file wasn't, the web page wasn't actually found. And if that's the case, I'll just say not found. I could say, well, how about if it was found and everything went perfectly? And to do that, I could test the 200 code, the holy grail of going to a web page. It means everything worked perfectly. And in that case, what I'm going to do is create a variable called HTML returned and set that to hold the text returned. So that will be the entire content of the file. And then just to prove this has worked, I'll just print it out as well. All other possibilities. Lots of other possible status codes exist. I'll just cover by saying a message, status code, and then I'll put the name of the status code in uh, a placeholder. And a format function and substitute in, substitute in the status code received. So if I run that, that should give me success, I hope. And after a short time, while it's going to the website, that's the HTML returned from it. That's all good. If I change this slightly now, or completely in fact, to a web page which doesn't exist, so what I'm going to do is choose this one. It should be Python videos, not Cobra, that can't be right. So if I run this, I should get a 404 error. It's gone to this uh, segment of the if statement. And if I return back to what I had before, but put maybe a silent Q in the middle, that domain doesn't actually exist. And this time I'll get an error when I run it. So I need to build error trapping around this to check it's actually working. So that's how you can get uh, text from a website. What we'll now do is look at how you can get text from a file, and then we'll go on to actually do some scraping. So what I want to do now is to look at how you can get HTML from a file like this one, windham.htm. And this is actually much easier. So I've created a program called HTML from file.py. And we're going to get uh, HTML from a file. To do that, I can just use a standard open statement. So I can say with open, put a cheeky little R in there, paste in the contents of the clipboard, which gives me the location of my file. And what I'll do is call that Wyndham file. Incidentally, it seems that you can't use the request module to browse to a file on your hard disk. You can only use it to go to a website URL. So what I can now do is store the response. And to do that, I'll create a variable called HTML text, and I'll set that equal to uh, Wyndham file. And then I'll use the read method to return the entire contents of the file. So now all I need to do is check that works. So I can print out the HTML text. And if I try running this program, you'll see it should give me the contents of my file. Subject to one rather strange character at the beginning, it's all worked perfectly. And now, finally, I think we're ready to do some scraping. So we're finally ready to install Beautiful Soup. I've included a file called usefulwebsites.txt with this tutorial. And if you click on the link in that to go to the Beautiful Soup um, help page, you can see the documentation on it. It's beautifully written and it's used as a lovely simple example. So along with this tutorial, I really think that's the only thing you'll need to get started. I recommend it thoroughly. So I need to firstly find out whether I've got Beautiful Soup installed. So I'll go to a terminal window and list out my modules, pip space list. Beautiful Soup isn't there. I didn't think it would be. So let's add it. So I'll do pip install and Beautiful Soup, except you need to be very careful. That will install an old version. You need to do Beautiful Soup 4 to get the latest version. So now if I run that code, it will install Beautiful Soup and also something called Soup Civ 2, which is, I presume is a dependent module. That's great, I can now use it. So what I can do is um, 
import that module. So I've created a file called basic scraping .py. And within this, what I can do is say from the module, which is actually called BS4, not beautiful soup, I'm going to import the thing I need, which is beautiful soup. I googled what beautiful stone soup is, and as far as I can see, it seems to be an older version, but it's very difficult to find any information on it, I found. So now I've got beautiful soup available to me, I can use it to make sense of my HTML text I've got from my file. So to do this, what I'll do is create a variable called soup. That seems to be a very common name to call it. I'll take my beautiful soup module and apply it, or beautiful soup function, I should say, apply it to my HTML text. And I think I'll leave it at that. I'll specify a parser later. We'll come back to what I mean by that in a second. So let's see if that's worked. What I need to do is print it out. And I'll just quickly try running that. And you can see it gives me the output. I'll come back to this message at the top in a second. But you can see it's given me the output. It's a bit of a mess. I could do with it being a bit prettier. So what I'm going to do is apply the prettify method. And what that will do is allegedly make it look a bit nicer to read. And it has done. Now as to this message at the top, what it's saying is this. When you go to um, look at the contents of HTML, you need to specify the parser. And if you don't, by default, it will decide which one to use. So I've created or included a file with this um, tutorial called possibleparsers.png. And if you look, have a look at that, you'll see there's four main ones you can choose. By default, you'll be using html.parser. And most people do, but there's other alternatives available. For example, if you're choosing XML, you'll definitely need to change that. Now, I'm a simplistic person, I'm just going to use html.parser, but I think the important thing, and this is what the warning is trying to tell you, is that you choose something. Because if you don't, there's a possibility that the results you get may look different according to which machine you run the program on. So if I now run that program, you can see that it suppresses the warning message because it's happy I've chosen the parser. So that's basic scraping. What we now need to do is learn how to get information out of all this HTML. So to show scraping uh, chaining elements together, I've created a file called scraping1-chainingelements.py. But what I've also done is split the screen in two, and I'm showing the web page I'm scraping on the right-hand side. And what I'd encourage you to do is to press the F12 key to see development tools, so you can see the document object model for this page I'm scraping. So let's see how chaining elements works. So the first thing I'm going to do is show the first uh, hyperlink. Do this, I can print out soup. I'm going to look just within the body section, and I'm going to print out the first hyperlink. Remember, it's an A tag. So if I run that, astonishingly, it's that simple and it gives me the first hyperlink, which is this owl at the top. Let's delve deeper. deeper. I'll just comment that out. And this time, let's print out the first hyperlink in the first table cell. So to do that, I can print soup. I don't need to put dot .body. I'm going to look for td tag, which is a table cell. But the only place that can possibly be is within the body. So although soup.body.td probably would be easier to understand and might even run more quickly, it's not necessary. And the first hyperlink is the A tag. Now if I run that, it will give me the day of the Triffids because here's the first table cell. This is a TH tag, not a TD tag. So that's the first table cell and it contains the day of the Triffids as a hyperlink. Now you can take this to ridiculous extent, and that's what I'm going to do now. So I'll put print out, and the comment is just going to be too long, so let's just see what it does. So I want to print out the first hyperlink in the first table cell in the first row in the first table in the body section of the page. So I'm going to print out soup.body.table.tr.td.a. Now, before we run this, I want to explain why it's going to return an error. If you look at the body section, the first table it contains is actually um, within this div section. Let's see if I can find it. No, it's not. It's within this div section. It's there. 
there's the table. The first row within that is this one, and you can see it's highlighted on the left hand side that this is the title row. This doesn't contain any TD tags. It only contains TH tags. So when I try to get at the TD tag, that will give me none. And then it will try to get an A tag within a non-existent object and return an error to that effect. So if I run that, you can see it says exactly the error message I was predicting that it's not working. So there's nothing wrong with the command. It's just that the HTML didn't support it. And this illustrates a problem with chaining elements together, that it always just returns the first uh, tag within the parent tag, which is often not what you want to do. So what we'll do is go on firstly to look at how you can look at navigable strings, and then we'll look at ways around this problem so you can return more useful information. So it's often useful when you're scraping a website to get at the visible, usable text. And as an example, what I'm going to do is firstly get the text the day of the Triffids there, and then get all of the links in all the table cells. The first one will use a string property, the second one will use strings or some modification of it. So let's start with getting the string. So I've created a new file called scraping 2 navigable strings.py with the usual code at the top to get the content of this HTML file. So what I'm now going to do is to show the uh, visible text, let's call it, of the first uh, book. So to do this, I can print out, I'm going to go to the soup, I'm going to go to the first table cell. Now this will work because the first table cell is actually this one. Had I put tr.td, as in the previous example, it would have given me an error because it would have tried to go to the header section, but just putting td will work. So then from that, I'm going to pick out the string. And I think this will, in fact, let's just put td for the moment. And if I run that, you'll see it gives me the HTML. I want to get the visible text. So if I put string in, I think this will probably give me an error message, or at least none, because the table cell itself doesn't have uh, any visible text. The hyperlink within it does. So if I put dot a dot string, then I'll get the visible text. The visible text is often a bit of a mess, so it's common practice to then strip it like this to get rid of trailing and leading blanks, and then I'll get something much more readable. So that's the basic string property. Uh, usually more useful is to get a set of strings. So what I'm going to do now is to print out all the visible their descriptions as well, I think. So to do this, I'll create a variable to hold the um, links, or the link texts, let's say. So to do this, I'll take the first table, and from that, I will extract all of the strings. I'll then loop over those, so I'll say for, uh, let's say, t in link texts. And for every single bit of information I've extracted, I'll just print it out. And if I try running that, you'll see it gives me all of the text with a lot of blank space in as well, like so. I'm not quite sure why they provide the strings uh, uh, property, because there's also something called stripped strings, which is so much more useful. What this does is exactly the same thing, but automatically apl applies the string method to it. So if I run that now, you can see a much more useful thing of all the visible text within the first table on the web page. And when I saw this, it kind of blew my mind with Python. I thought, how can I do something so useful so quickly in so few lines of code? What I want to do now is show how you can get at the relatives of an element. So what on earth does relatives mean in this context? It turns out HTML elements have children and parents and siblings and a whole family tree. So using our example, I've got here the chrysalids selected, the whole row. It's my second favorite John Wyndham book after the day of the Triffids. If you look at that element, it has siblings. It has the next siblings, which are the chalky and the trouble with lichen rows. It has previous siblings, which are the rows just above it there. It has a next element, which is the immediately following row, and a previous element, which is the immediate preceding one. It has children. There they are. 
The children are the next level down, but it also has descendants, which includes not just the children, but their children, so on down till you reach the bottom of the tree. It also has parents, the immediate parents, parent rather, it's a T-body tag, but you can go back and find all the ancestors going back right up to the top of the tree. So this is why I said about the document object model. Until you understand the document object model of your page, you may not be able to make much sense of it. Now I've summarized that in a file included within this tutorial called scraping3relatives.png. And those are the main um, things that you can get at. The only thing which possibly needs further explanation at this point is contents versus children. One of them returns the contents, the immediate children as a list. The other is something called a generator. In practice, it makes virtually no difference. And if I were you, I would stick to using contents. It's, it's more versatile and will meet all your needs. So let's have a look at some examples. I've created a file called scraping3-relatives.py. And within that, we've got the usual code to get the HTML from our website. And what I want to do is actually look at this first image. So let's just bring up the um, HTML and the document object model again. So what I'm going to do is look at that image. So to do this, I'm going to create a variable to refer to the first div tag. So I'll call that first div, and I'll set it equal to soup.div. What I can then do is look at its immediate children. To do that, I will create a loop. I'll say for child in first div. And what I can then do is use either the contents or the children. They'll both work pretty much the same way as I explained. So, and I, I said we should always use contents, so let's stick to that. And for each of those, I'm going to print out the child element. So if I um, run that program, you'll see it gives me a single uh, bit of HTML. And that's because if you look at the first div tag, the immediate child is that one. It can't, the image is a separate uh, child within that. Now, let's look at the implications of changing the word contents here to descendants. In fact, so you can keep the original code, let's actually take a copy of this and change this to look at the descendants. Change the word contents to descendants and comment out those previous lines so I get a clear answer. The difference when I run this is I will get more information. I will get the immediate child, which is the hyperlink tag, and then any tags within that. There's only one, so I only see one further bit of information. But you can imagine that if I listed out the descendants of the entire web page, I'll get a very, very long list of HTML tags. So that's how you can use relatives to navigate over the tree. So what we're now going to do is look at the most useful method in Beautiful Soup, I think anyway, which is find all. What we're going to do is look at finding elements by tag, by attribute, and by class, and also doing some non-recursive finds, whatever they may turn out to be. So starting with elements by tag, I've got a file here called scraping4-finding.py. And within this, I'm going to take the soup generated and I'm going to use it to create a list of links, hyperlinks. Probably the first thing anyone would want to do when they're scraping a website. So to do that, I'm going to create a variable called links and I'm going to set it equal to, well, I'll take the soup generated and I'll use the find all method. You can see that from the previous section that all the supported relatives are supported with find all as well. So I could limit my finding to just the siblings or the parents or the children and so on. But I'm going to find everything within the entire web page. And what you can do then is specify the name argument. So I could put name equals, but I could, because it's the first argument, I can just actually miss out the name of the argument and just put A in quotation marks. And that will automatically go through my entire web page, generating a list of all the hyperlinks. It's that simple. So now I can say for every single link I found, for the links in the list, I could just print out the link. And if you run that, you'll see astonishingly that those three lines of code generate all the links. This first one may look a bit odd because it includes an image. But I don't really want all the links. I just want the, the URLs, the href tags, or the href attributes rather. So what I'm going to do is modify this slightly. Let's just close that down. And I will just get the 
uh, href tag. So to do this, I'm going to create a variable called URL. And I'm going to take the link I've just uh, found and get the value of a particular attribute. Again, it's that easy. And then I can print that out. And just in case there's any trailing and uh, leading spaces, I'm going to get rid of those. Now you may notice when I typed in dot strip, it didn't actually come up with any IntelliSense. And that's because this actually returns this as an object. So what I need to do is I need to convert it to a string of text before I could do anything with it. So then I can strip it. If I now try running this program, you should see it gives me a list, astonishingly, of all the links on the page. I think I ha if I could date a time and I fell in love with Python, it was running this program from the tutorial or a variation of it, because it was just so simple to do. So that's how you can list elements by tag. Let's now list elements by attribute. So we're going to do two examples of this. The first one is let's get the element with ID table dash box. And the second one will get anything with a source attribute. So for the first one, get the element with given ID. So to do this, I'm going to create a, a variable, I'll call it element. I'll take the soup. Equals, find all. And the element I'm going to look for is the one called table box. But I'm looking for an attribute and not an element, so I need to include the name of the attribute, like so. Now that will uh, create a list of all the elements with the ID of table box, but the whole point of an ID is that it has to be unique on the page. So although I could have used just find, um, I'm going to return it as a list, and I'm just going to list out all of the elements, and something has gone seriously wrong with my page if it lists out more than a single element. So what I'll do is say for... Um, L in element, and I'll print out the name of the element. And if I run that program, you can see it gives me a div at the bottom, because um, that's the tag name of it. So that's one example. Let's do another. So this time, let's print out all the elements which have got an SRC tag. Now, SRC is something that only images do, so I would expect to see an image as a result of this. said SRC tag, I meant attribute. It's very easy to get those two things confused. So I'll create a variable called sources, and I'll set it equal to all of the elements where the source tag equals true. So without source attribute, so whatever attribute you're looking for, you can just type in the name of it followed by a value. And then I'll list them out. Every single one I found, I will print out that element. Now, there should only be one from this, and there it is. And the reason for that is because I've got only one image on my page. So that's examples listing things out by attribute. So for the third thing I said we'd do, we're going to list elements by class. And for this, we're going to list all the things which have got the dot link class assigned to them. Now, I think that's almost equivalent to saying all the hyperlinks, because that's what I've used the link class for to make them look blue. But let's find out. So what I'm going to do is create a variable called classy links. Classy in the sense of having the class attached to them, that is. And I'm going to find all the elements where the class equals the link. And you may be thinking, well, he showed me this already. It's just another attribute. But it's a very special attribute. Because class is a reserved word, you have to put an underscore after it to get this to work. And it's very easy to forget that. So I'm going to say whether class equals link. And what I'll then do is loop over each of those. So for, it's called LK in classy links. And for each of those, I'll just print out uh, the link. Rather than printing out the link, I'll just print the navigable string, and I'll strip that to get rid of any leading and trailing spaces. So if I run that, and I think it's possibly time to comment out some of this other stuff, because we're getting quite a lot of extra information on here. 
If I run that program, you can see it gives me just the visible text on the links. You'll notice I haven't got anything for the image at the top because that didn't have the class linker attached to it. So the last quick thing we were going to do was look at non-recursive finds. By default, find all will look all the way down the document object model, but you might want to look at the current level only. So to do an example of this, let's list out all the div tags, except it won't, as we're about to see. So we'll create a variable called uh, tags and set it equal to uh, the soup dot find all. And then what I'm going to do is look for the div tags. But rather than going down looking at all the div tags at all the levels, I'm going to add an additional argument saying recursive and set that to be false. By default, it's true. If I then loop over all these tags, so say for a tag in tags, and if I print out the tag, and I'll just comment out these previous lines of code, so I get a virgin uh, printout, I won't get anything. And the reason for that is at the body level, sorry, at the top level of the soup, there aren't any div, tag, div tags. So I'm looking at this level up here, and the div tag is within the body. If, on the other hand, I were to change this recursive to true, then what it will do is start at the top level and look recursively down and list every single div tag. So when I run that, you can see I get lots and lots of div tags, which is normally what you would want to see. So in the final part of this tutorial, I've created a file called scraping 5 CSS selectors.py. And what we're going to do is take the soup and use it to search by tag, by class, and by ID. And you may think, well, that's exactly what we just did, and you'll be right. But this time, instead of using the find and find all methods, we're going to use the select and select one methods. And the difference between them is that these are suitable if you've used jQuery or CSS or style sheets before. They use the convention of a hash preceding an element uh, ID and a dot preceding a class name. So if that all sounds very familiar to you, you'll probably like this approach. So let's do the first example, searching by tag. What we're going to do is list out all of the table headers, the TH uh, tags in our page. I'm going to go straight for listing. So I'm going to say for um, each header, let's call it. I'll take the soup and I will use the select method to pick out all the TH tags. There's a bit of a naming um, mistake here, I think. It should be called select underscore all and just select. And that would make it analogous with find all and maybe find one, sorry, find. So I'm going to choose the select method, and then in brackets, I can specify the tag I want to select, which is th. I'll put a colon after that, and then I'll just print out the results. So that should give me my two table headers. So if I try running that, you'll see that's exactly what it does. Now you may say at this point, why didn't you just use find underscore all, which does exactly the same thing? And the answer is, I could have done. So when you're listing out, tags, it makes no difference which one you use. Let's do a second example then where it will make a difference and let's, list, let's list all the elements with the link class attached to them. So to do this, I can create, in fact, let's just go straight for doing it. I'll say for each element in and I'll take the soup and I'll select all of the elements with the link class. The dot is a prefix which any website developer will know denotes a class. So what I can then do is print out the element, or because I know what I'm going to get, I'm just going to print out the, the visible string for the element and strip that. So I get rid of any trailing and preceding spaces. And if I run that, you'll see it gives me um, my two table headers and then my visible text for my tags. So that's the second example. And the third one we're going to do, if I just comment out the previous lines, is going to search by the ID. So we're going to print out just a single element. So to do this, I'm going to create um, a variable called top div, because that's what it is, or will be. So this time, rather than using select to select a set of elements when I know there'll only be one, I'm going to use select one. And this time I can use a hash to denote the fact the thing I'm looking for has an ID attached to it of table books. That's what the hash means there. So now that I've got that, I could print out something about it. And I'm just going to print out the element itself. 
So if I run that, you can see it gives me the HTML for that top element. Which one you use, whether you use find all or select is up to you. I guess it depends on your experience of website development. And with that, you're in a position to start scraping websites. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Let me know how you get on.